first, let me thank uh, Okopolis and the Heinrich Boll Stiftung for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and a great honor. And I'm also very pleased to see the very high level of political representation here. It's good to see that your politicians listen to you a little more than the British politicians listen to us. Uh, I want to talk about the economics of nuclear power. A nuclear power was saddled from the start with the promise that it could never have fulfilled. It was the promise that everybody remembers was that nuclear power would give power too cheap to meter. And everybody now knows that was a, a, a foolish dream and it's never going to happen. But the belief that nuclear power is still cheap still persists despite all the evidence. And in Britain, for example, there has been so much evidence over the past 20 years of bankrupt nuclear companies, of failed uh, power stations where we spent 4 billion euros building a nuclear power plant and a year later to privatize it, we had to give it away. There's so much evidence, but it doesn't seem to get through to people. There is still that belief that nuclear power is cheap. Uh, the first question, though, let me talk about global warming. And uh, one of the strong points about nuclear power it is, is that it is relatively low carbon. We can argue about how much carbon is produced in the mining of uranium, but basically it's pretty low carbon. But it's quite easy to, to prove that nuclear power can only make a relatively small difference to uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. At present, it makes up about 15% of world electricity, and electricity makes up about 20% of world energy. So at present, nuclear power is providing about 3% of world energy. If we were to be very optimistic and we increased nuclear share of electricity threefold to about the level that France has, and we doubled electricity share uh, of energy, nuclear would still be less than 20% of our energy. So nuclear power by itself is not going to solve nuclear, uh, global warming. That doesn't mean we shouldn't, that's not enough to say that we shouldn't do nuclear power, but it, it means it's uh, one of just, just a number of policies that we're going to have to carry out. And I think it was uh, Sokolov, uh, an American economist, who talked about the need for seven policies. He called them policy wedges. And nuclear could be one of those wedges. But it will have to compete with the other options. It has to be the cheapest option for achieving that particular reduction in greenhouse gases that it can achieve. The next question I'd like to talk about is whether nuclear power is an option. And when I talk about nuclear economics, the first question I always get is from somebody from the nuclear industry will jump up and say, yes, but what's the alternative to nuclear power? And the assumption behind that, of course, is always that nuclear power is an option. And I'm not sure it is, and I'll try and argue that in the next few minutes. You'll all have heard of the nuclear renaissance, which has been around for about 10 years. And that was based on the premise that you could have a new generation of nuclear designs that would be uh, much better than their predecessors. And the idea was that nuclear power stations had become very complicated because of successive layers uh, of safety systems as a result of the various accidents that there's been. And the idea was that if you stripped all those safety systems away, you could redesign them in a much more rational and simple way. And you can already see that I'm waving my hands because it's a very good hand-waving argument. It sounds plausible that you can make things simpler by rationalizing it uh, and therefore by making them simpler, they'll be cheaper. And the US Department of Energy was one of the first converts to this particular line of thinking. And in 2003, they said, new generation three plus designs. That's what generation three plus is the shorthand for this new generation, have the advantage of vastly improved safety features and significant simplification is expected to result in lower and more predictable construction and operating costs. So we have a, the dream comp, uh, combination of safer but simpler, therefore cheaper and therefore easy to build and therefore less likely to 
run into the big cost overruns and time overruns that nuclear power projects have typically run into. And the promise that went with this was that you could build these new plants for $1,000 per kilowatt. Typical nuclear power station is maybe 1.6 million kilowatts. So that meant that you could build a big nuclear power station for $1.6 billion. Now, as the, the first speaker said, the end was clear from his slides that the nuclear renaissance was failing long before Fukushima. Fukushima has not stopped something that was working very well. Uh, there are only eight new orders for these new generation plants, and six of those are in China. Uh, the other two are in France uh, and in Finland. So why was the Renaissance failing? The first uh, explanation I'd like to look at is the, the economics. It's simply too expensive. The second explanation touched on by the last speaker was that it's actually very difficult to get finance for nuclear power. Uh, projects now. Third explanation is that, that actually getting safety approval for these new designs is very difficult. And the final explanation is that they are very difficult to build. So you can make the economics of nuclear power very complicated because there's a huge number of variables you have to think about, huge number of ethical uh, cost protection issues that make it very difficult to produce a comprehensive forecast of nuclear costs. But you can make it quite simple because if you assume that two-thirds of the cost of a kilowatt hour of nuclear electricity comes from the construction uh, part of the project, then that's a pretty good rule of thumb. And that means you need to look at the construction cost and you need to look at the cost of financing build. Now the promise of $1,000 a kilowatt was very quickly proved wrong. The first order at Olkiluoto was about three times that cost. And in recent bidding contests and recent estimates by US utilities who are planning to build new nuclear power plants, the cost seems to be coming out at around $6,000 per kilowatt. So we're looking at, instead of $1.6 billion for a large nuclear power station, we're looking at $10 billion per kilowatt, uh, per, per nu large nuclear power station. And of course, we haven't completed building any of these yet. And historically, cost estimates have always be, tended to be a significant underestimate of the actual outturn costs. So what about finance? And I think the experience of the last decade has made it very clear that banks are unwilling to finance the construction of nuclear power plants if they're going to bear the risk. If things go wrong, uh, banks are not willing to be exposed to the risk that the company building the nuclear power plant won't be able to repay them. So they'll only finance nuclear power plants if somebody else is taking that risk. Now traditionally that's always been consumers via cost pass-through and that's how pretty much every nuclear power plant in the world has been built on the assumption that whatever it costs to build and operate the plant, consumers will pay. You simply pass all the costs on to them. And for a bank, that's the perfect solution because consumers always do pay. They always do pay their electricity bills. So there is no risk to a bank lending in that circumstance. And I think, cutting to the end, I think the, that's the only viable way of financing new nuclear power stations there. A promise, a blank check by consumers signed off for the project that they will pay whatever it costs. People have looked at uh, taxpayers via loan guarantees. So if, uh, for example, you were to import, import a, a plant from France, if things went wrong, then French taxpayers would repay that loan through the credit guarantees because they would repay the bank. The problem with that is that that's fine as long as nothing goes wrong. If something goes wrong and costs escalate, then the company has to borrow some more money. And of course, then it's got to go to the market uh, and ask banks to lend money for a failing project. And of course, that's going to be very expensive. So I think the, the idea that uh, credit guarantees backed by governments are going to solve the problem of financing, I don't think that's the case. 
third option is that vendors themselves could take the risk by fixing the uh, price of the contract so that whatever it costs to build, the vendor would, would stick to that original contract price. And that was the deal for the Olkiluoto plant, the plant being build, built in Finland. So it's proving quite difficult to convince regulators that these new designs are safe enough. And of course, Fukushima is something that we're only beginning to understand now. And the implications, implications for designs are going to take years to unfold. And I think the one thing that is clear is that Fukushima is not going to reduce costs. What about buildability? This, remember, this was the other leg of the promise, that they would be safer, uh, simpler, cheaper, and more buildable. And I have a quote here from a former chief executive of EDF saying that actually the problem with the EPR, the French design being built at uh, Olkiluoto in Finland and Flamanville in France, is that it's actually much too complicated. So the promise that they would be much simpler was simply wrong. They've actually become more complicated. And as uh, one of the previous speakers showed you, Olkiluoto is, was expected to take four years. It's now going to take nine years, and the costs are nearly double. When Olkiluoto was first talked about, it was assumed that everything would go perfectly because this was the shop window for the new generation. And, of course, things went quickly wrong. When things started to go wrong, people said, well, actually, no. It's the problem is that Finland's not very good at building nuclear power plants. But France, they built 58 of them. EDF knows how to do it. And, of course, EDF is doing just as badly as Finland at the same stage. So there seems to be a very big problem of buildability. The promise that you could make them simpler and therefore get over the problem of, uh, not, uh, of cost and price overruns simply hasn't been achieved. So what are my conclusions then? The, the simple first conclusion is that nuclear can only be a small part of climate change uh, uh, policy. And it has to compete with the other options like energy efficiency uh, and renewables. Fukushima will be a convenient excuse for the nuclear industry for another failed uh, nuclear revival. As with Three Mile Island, as with Chernobyl, things were going badly wrong for the nuclear industry before then. If they want an excuse to look for, Fukushima will be a good one, but they shouldn't pretend that it's, that's really the problem. And the problem is the technology and the economics. And the fundamental question, I think, that comes back again after Fukushima is, can we design water-cooled and moderated reactors like the ones that you have at Paksh, like the ones in the rest of the world, that will stand up to a loss of coolant accident, that will stand up to a loss of uh, power on site and still be safe and still be economic? And I think another big question we need to ask is, why after 50 years of developing nuclear power, are real costs still going up? I mean, this is very hard to understand. Why are things like scale economies, technical progress, learning, all the things that you would expect to operate with a normal technology, why haven't they worked with nuclear power? It's as if uh, a mobile phone was still the size of a brick, only worked within the uh, confines of Budapest, and cost you 10,000 euros a year to run. You would think by now, that's a pretty bad technology. There's something wrong with it if it's not improving in that way. So to go back to my original question, is nuclear power an option? Well, I suppose it is an option in a way, but it's a very risky one because we don't know what the costs are. We haven't completed any of these plants yet. We have the added twist of Fukushima. We don't know how to finance them other than consumers signing a blank check as they've always done in the past. We don't know what the safety requirements are going to be because the, the lessons from Fukushima are going to take decades to emerge, not, not uh, years and months. And the problem uh, of buildability still exists, that the experience in Finland and France shows that the old problems that we don't know how to build them to time and cost still exist. Thank you.